Memories are great. My, my, my. Memories are tremendous. I've been sitting here reminiscing all this time. I got a feeling, it, just like it happened one other time, we had 620-some people in church. <laughs> you got to watch him, he lies. <laughs> one of the memories I had was, oh, we hadn't been here very long, about three weeks, maybe four. I was standing over to the door over there in the, the old sanctuary. Lorne Brown was standing there with me. I said, Lorne, it's looking kind of slim this morning. He says, it sure is. I said, you know what we got to do? Let's step outside and let's wave in the first car that comes by into the parking lot. And it so happened he didn't know my parents were coming with a car load. <laughs> And about that time they come around that corner, and I go, come in here, come on in. Preacher, you really did it, didn't you? <laughs> and we go to, oh, I just think of all the memories. My goodness. Uh, folks, I don't know how long you plan on being here today. I had a preacher tell me one time up in Kansas City, Pastor, I don't know how long you plan on preaching. You got the pulpit, you can go as long as you want. But we people are going home at 12 o'clock. <laughs> Sandy, you owe me 15 minutes yet. I kept track all those years. I, I went over and it didn't, and under, and so you still owe me 15 minutes. So it's her fault if I go over today, folks. But uh, I'm so happy to be here. This has been a week, as I've told Jerry and a couple others, that my wife and I, ever since Pastor Hub's call, said, we're going home. We're going home this week. And we feel like we're home right here. And I've seen the changes, my goodness, the changes. Jerry, you mentioned something about you didn't put in a dollar. I got just something for you here. Part of it's for you. It's a story of a preacher one day who stood before the congregation. Brother Art, as he stood before the congregation, he said, folks, we have a need in the church. And so we're going to take up a special offering today. And in order for you to really get involved in this and enjoy this, you're going to, I'm going to allow the person who gives the largest amount, the privilege of coming up here and selecting the next three hymns. Wow. The offering was taken. The preacher looked down. And Jerry Pyatt walked by. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Not a thing. But there was a thousand dollar bill laying there in an offering plate. He says, folks, I don't know who did that, but that's sure a blessing to you to put a thousand dollars in the offering plate. Would you hold your hand up and, and a little old lady way, way in the back of the church held up her hand. He says, ma'am, would you please come down here? And the preacher met her right here. Sure, thank you for giving that $1,000. That's a lot of money for anybody to give these days. She looked up at him and kind of smiled. By this time, she's feeling a little more at ease, standing there in front of everybody, and she's looking over the congregation. He says, ma'am, go ahead, and you can pick out three hymns. She says, I'll take that one, that one, and that one. My gracious. Oh, we're in a good place today, aren't we? Oh, my. Ed, I, I couldn't help but think of a question you had for me one day. You come up with a question here in church, and I said, well, I looked that answer up. And you come into church a week later, and you were overjoyed. And you said, Pastor, I found the answer. It was right here in the book. Amen? 
The answers are in the book today. That's where we need to turn when we've got a problem these days. And we've got a problem in our world today, and I, I know you're well aware of it. And Jerry did uh, a good job on this subject, too, during the Sunday school hour. Do you know that we're really worried these days about the virus that's going around? And rightly so. But I, I read an article this week whereby we're now reaching some 380 some thousand people that have perished because of it. But yet at the same time you double that and go into the 800,000 and we find that our nation has murdered that many children already this year. We're living in an evil time today. That's why we need to join ranks today. Isn't that good? To be able to join ranks together. Come together here as a church body. And love one another. Be kindly about one another. And if you don't, I, I tell you what I told him up at Grace Baptist the first time the preacher asked me to preach while he was gone. I said, folks, don't say anything bad about the preacher to me because I'll rat. I'll tell. I love preachers, and I should love preachers, and you should too, because they carry forth the word of God. We have a great responsibility before us. And you see a picture up here behind me that I, I one of my favorite ones. Favorite, first of all, because two grandkids. And that's my youngest daughter's two grand our two sons. And I take that because of the title that we have that I want to share with you today, and that is my escort, my escort. And then we also have a hymn title there, You'll Never Walk Alone. Well, that's good news, isn't it? You'll never walk alone. And you know, you've been singing so well, and I, I, I want to ask Ellen and Dennis to come back up the front here at the piano if they would. And there's a song that I love, and you did so well for 18 years here. Every time we sang, well, you'll have to find her, please. And give me time here. And that is, He Lives. My Lord lives today, folks. He's alive today. How do I know that? How do you know that? Because I talked to him today, amen? amen? And if you've talked to him, he's alive because he talks back to you. He answers our prayers today. Each of you here, here today, as far as I can tell, you've all been here, right? Anybody that hasn't been here to this church before? Buddy, you're in trouble. That's my granddaughter. You better treat her right. Well, you knew what to expect, right? So you're not here by accident. You're here because you aim to be here and because you know that in the Sunday school hour and the worship service and then again in the evening worship service, the word of God is gonna be preached. And that's what is my responsibility today, is to share with you the Word of God. And while Dennis and Ellen are getting ready to come here, I, I want to talk to you about the simple fact of never walking alone, and the fact of that we as Christians today, we have a mediator. That mediator is the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we as he takes care of the situations in our life for us. You know, the devil wants you. The devil wants each and every one of you. He's doing all he can so that he can get you to the place where you're going to doubt the simple fact that you're a Christian. And if he can get you to doubt your salvation, he's won a major part of the battle. But I'm glad that we have this mediator that is alive today. That's Jesus Christ. He lives today. And I want us to sing 
two verses of that. And ladies and gentlemen, when it comes down to that chorus, I know you can sing out loud, I've heard you. And I just want us to sing that song, He Lives Today. It's in there, I found it. <laughs> and somebody said, are you going to sing a special preacher? I said, not unless the Holy Spirit tells me. And he's smarter than that. Amen. <laughs> he lives. Think of this. Our Lord, he lives. I got some glasses here. Page number 407. Everybody up. Everybody up. I had a man the other day complain about his preacher. He said, every time he sings a song, we got to get up. Every time he sings a song, we got to get up. Every time he takes the offering up, we got to give up. Every time he, he reads the word of God, we got to get up. I said to him, Preacher, you know what, what church you pastor, anyhow? <laughs> Go ahead, brother. You're leading them, not me. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the Amen there. And what is leading, whatever man may say. Just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, as Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation's here in Lord. You ask me how I know he standing, I'm going to be reading out of Isaiah chapter number 41, Isaiah chapter number 41, and verse number 13. Concerning the chapter that we now have before us, the preceding two chapters deals with the fact of what God's people had done, how that they have misled their lives. They had fallen into sin. They had gone to the place where they were even marrying into other nationalities, which they, God had said we're not to do. And so we find that God here tells us in verse number 13, For I, the Lord, thy God, will hold thy right hand. Amen? 
I will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. You may be seated. I will help thee. Now the reason that I chose the picture up on the wall there is a simple fact. If you'll notice, the little three-year-old is keeping up with brother. Notice his heel right there. They're in perfect step as far as for two kids and the different sizes that they are. Now the big brother, he's a junior in high school this year and he's fighting to stay under 300 pounds. And so you can tell he's a big young man. But I have a, per, a something that's really unique I get to tell you today is that Tucker has trusted Christ as his personal savior. His older sister has tested Christ. Oh boy. All of our grandkids up there have trusted Christ as their personal savior. I got to lead their daddy to the Lord. Wow. It's, we got this little one yet. And he, it, you never know what he's going to say. Grandparents, granddads especially, how many of you at some time or other when the little one like that sitting on your lap and you just reach over and you kiss him on the cheek and say, I love you, son? Am I the only one? We've done that, right? You know what he said? He turned around and looked at me. Boys don't kiss boys. <laughs> Wow. I said, this is a special occasion, son. It's okay. <laughs> and so we're talking about being an escort today at times in the message here today. And I'm glad that one of these days, and for you too, and we, I was looking over the congregation here, many people that were here 18 years ago are gone. But an angel came and escorted them where? To the kingdom of heaven. Hallelujah. I'm looking forward to the day, as Jerry mentioned, that I'll be able to see my Savior face to face. How about you? Amen. Amen. Face to face with our Savior. But in the meanwhile, we talk about an escort taking place. What does an escort have a responsibility of doing? Well, many of you, if you talk about an escort, you will think of that of a wedding. Weddings. Wow. If the mother-in-law's to be would stay home, there would be no problem at a wedding. But I've had problems that way. <laughs> but notice this. Notice this. At the wedding, we have those who escort in the ladies as they come down the aisle. Now, those gentlemen are out there for her protection, to help her as she comes up on the platform. They're to be there so that she will not fall. Protection. Well, other places that we talk about, the fact of that of being an escort is out on Friday night, either at a football game or a winter basketball game, the last game of the season usually, and you have the queen candidate and the king candidate out there. He's out there again for protection. And so today, we can say that the theme of our message is walking with our Savior. How many of you want to walk with the Lord? Isn't that a good feeling when we're walking with the Lord? We know things are right. We've called on him. We've confessed our petty sins that we have. And now we're able to reach out and extend our hand. And we know that our Savior is right there. Now, if he's not there, the problem has come up that you have done something that should not have taken place. That is this. You have walked away and you are now in a about-face position. 
Our Lord is not going to leave us. What does he tell us in John 3.16? You quote it for me. Only begotten Son, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. Ed, I'm going to heaven. And Jerry's going to be there. He brought it up, not me. He's going to be there, and I'm going to be there, and we're going to have a great time in heaven because we're going to be under the leadership and the direction, and we're going to see our Savior face to face, and heaven knows we're not going to mess up like that in front of our Lord right there. Amen? We're going to do our best that we can. I think of Jim Hyatt. Oh, my goodness. Jim Pye, I loved him. I became a thorn in his flesh. I mean, he became a... Right. But we had great times tormenting one another. But do you realize that when we get to heaven, oh, we're going to have great times again. We're going to see one another and we're going to know one another. I may leave here and not make it home. I don't know. You may not make it home. Only God knows the time that we have left, right? We're, it's all under his control. All of the problems that we're faced with today in America and in the world in which we live in has not caught our Lord off guard. He's well aware of everything. He's in control, folks. And just as... He has done throughout the scriptures, even concerning that, say, for instance, of Hezekiah. Hezekiah had a vast, what, supply of gold and silver. And what did he do? He displayed it all unto a servant of the Lord. And when he displayed it, he displayed it in that of a self-righteous way. And God, chastised him for it. And that gold and silver was spread abroad. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, our lives today are right in the hand of the Lord. You're born again? You're saved? You're a child of God? Then you, he has his hand extended right out for us to reach out. Sorry, Mother. She's always on to me for clapping my hands. <laughs> this is a good time. Amen? Amen? Give the Lord a hand clap. Amen? Amen? We can do that. Don't be afraid. And so we find this theme that we have before us today that we're now walking with the Savior. Well, I've told you before, I'll tell you again, I had a lady... Sunday school teacher taught me way back when I was in junior high. And then prior to that, and she taught the high school class and the junior high class. And when she taught us, she said, you boys. And she had a group of us. They were all honoring. I, I said on the other side of that. <laughs> but she said, anytime you're walking downtown, and you come across that pool hall down there, what are you going to do? Are you going to go in there? Or are you going to walk on by? And she says, think about this. When you walk on by, you've done a good thing. But if you walk in, what have you done? You've taken Jesus in there. Is that right? He's walking by our right hand, right? He's right beside us. The Holy Spirit lives and dwells within us. We're now born again. We are now righteous in the sight of God because our sins have been covered by what? The blood of Christ. Amen. Folks, I want you to know I have not changed, nor will I ever change. I am not saved by good works. I am saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God who came to this earth and died for me and for you. Amen. I will not change. That's the message that we have to deliver to the world today. But the world does not want to hear this simple message 
the message that Jesus saves. You see, my Bible tells me that he's the same today as he was yesterday. He'll be the same tomorrow, won't he? Same way. He does not change. And the word of God does not change. How many of you have read your Bible through? One time, completely through. Well, that's a challenge that the pastor put before us every year I've been up there. This year, I think I've taken on more than I can handle for a year's time. It's going to take me a little longer. But I have completed a few of the books, and I'm in chapter number 21 and chapter 19 of Revelation right now. I've almost completed the book of Psalms as well as having started way back in the Old Testament. And it's my desire to see how, how many papers it's going to take me to complete writing the Bible out this year. And so I'm in my process of it right now. And I will tell you this, folks, listen. When you write it out, if you're like I am, I'll write a little phrase to the next comma, to the next semicolon, Whatever the question mark might be, I have to look back and look back. Therefore, I can say that I have read this Bible the time I get done, get it all written out three to four times this year because of what I have done looking back and forth at the Word of God. And it's a challenge to you when you read it and you say, well, I, I don't like all those begats. Don't do them all at once. Wait a bit. All you got to do is say, I'll take him and him and him <laughs> and for a while. But I find that when I get into one book for quite some while, I want to go back to a different one and change the thought for just a little bit. But our Lord is a great Lord today. I can't praise him enough. And so I wanted to share with you today this thought of Jesus as my escort. I had another picture that I was going to share with you, but I didn't want to put it on the screen. And it's just a simple picture here of an admiral walking to a meeting. But before he could get to that meeting, because of the rank that he had, another individual was the escort of him as he was going to give his speech or to his meeting. For those of you who don't know, our grandson Logan, who Jerry scared to death one day when he put him up in one of those big uh, trucks that he had, and Logan was only about four or five years old at the time, and that boy, he wanted out of that truck fast. Well, he called his mother the other day and said, Mom, I'm only 40 miles away. Oh, good, where are you at? Oh, Mom, don't get too excited. I just got to stop over here at this air base and get some fuel for my helicopter that I'm flying. <laughs> He's now flying a helicopter for the United States Navy. Are we ever proud of it? But are we ever concerned because of the condition of the world in which we live in? He's a card. He's a clown. His commander said upon his graduation and receiving of his wing that this one and this one, it was Logan was the first one, they called in they said, what shall we do? We had a monarch butterfly fly in front of our helicopter. Are we in danger? Do we have to change our coordinates and all this and that? Only Logan would come up with that. And so we find our theme begins to change just a little bit before us today. I'm going to share some thoughts with you that I would have never thought of and would have never dreamed of. How many of you like basketball? Most of you. Football, sports of all kinds in this world. Well, I'm going to take you to one that my son came, Curtis came in the house one day and he said, Dad, I'm going to play soccer. You're what? <laughs> soccer. 
I could not believe it. My son going to play soccer. But I find out today that it's not soccer, it's football. It's taking over in this country that we live in like that. And there was a country, there was a team that started something that is very unique. It began in 1965. In 1965, there was a team that came into Liverpool, England, as well as several other teams, and they began something new that has never been played out. And they were following the top 10 list of the favorite songs at, at 1965 and 1966. And they would sing four of them. They'd sing one or two before the game and the other at halftime. For some unknown reason, and that reason came about as the movie Carousel. And in the movie Carousel, there was a song that they began to sing. You'll never have to walk alone. And that became the top hit song for four weeks in a row in England. And they adapted that song as their theme song for the halftime of their soccer ball game. And to this day, as you enter in, there's a sign that's been cut in metal that says you'll never have to walk alone. Now, folks, I love that song. I've listened to that song. I've listened to it mul multiple times here in the last two months. Now, notice the words. When you walk through a storm, hold your head up high, and don't be afraid of the dark. At the end of the storm, there's a golden sky, folks. Think of that. There's a golden sky and the sweet silver song of a lark. Walk on through the wind. Walk on through the rain. Though your dreams be tossed and blown. Walk on, walk on. And for four weeks, that was the number one song. But there was problems that developed. And there were those who wanted to scoff at the song and make fun of it and talk about the fact that it was a lack of faith, too much lack of faith within it. But I find that there's a lot of faith found in this song because on the way over, we listened to a message today on fear and being afraid. Folks, I'm afraid of a thing or two. And I believe you ought to be too. That is doing that which is displeasing unto the word of God. That ought to frighten us, hadn't it? Well, I'd be afraid of that because we want to do that which is pleasing unto our Lord. And so as we look at this and we talk about this song, this tabloid that came about. It's a picture. It's an illustration, shall we say, that is being portrayed before us in this song itself. Walk on. Don't be afraid. Hit the storm head on. We're going to be confronted with storm after storm in our life. Trouble after trouble is going to come. I see trouble right over there brewing. He's a fine young man, but he's taller than me now. Right, Jonathan? <laughs> Boy, has he grown since he was here. And my goodness, he's not alone. So many of you. Eric, you're getting too tall, bud. Do you still know your responsibility when I close the church? What, what's that? What do you say? Oh, nothing now. I love you, folks. Amen? How many times he took over for me and said, I love you. Well, as we look at this tabloid, you'll never 
walk alone. A gentleman minister walked into a hospital room one day. And as he walked in to the hospital room, an 85-year-old gentleman was laying in the bed. He was taking his last few breaths. It was well known. And as he was laying there, he looked up at the preacher and he had one request. Will you be my escort? Will you be my escort? My goodness, folks. My escort. Many of you have walked into a room like that with a relative of yours. They had the same thought, the same idea. Reach out, grasp a hold of your hand, and hold it. Hold it for security. Mrs. Wells up in Pullman, Washington, when it came time for her escort to come into the room, her brother told me she died with these words, Blessed Jesus. Blessed Jesus. Blessed Jesus. You know, I heard those words in church multiple times from her. Blessed Jesus. But her angel came into the room. Blessed Jesus. Oh, folks, listen. We're confronted these days with all types of trouble. But at the same time we're confronted with trouble, I want you to know the Lord is still in control. How do I know that? Because my Bible tells me this. Notice the next few words there in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse number 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness. Who in the world would be crying in the wilderness? The voice of him crying in the wilderness. Come on, tell me, who's that? That's a one that's coming prior to the Son of God. You know his name. He's called John. John the Baptist. We're finding reference to him way back here. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. He was preparing, setting things correct for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you think of that, friends, I want you to know God was in control. God sent his son. God knew his son would be faithful. He had a responsibility. And that responsibility was to come and to die for you and I. But God said, I'm going to send one before you. And the one I'm going to send before you is going to come and he's going to be different than most people. I don't know what you're going to have for dinner. I don't know what I'm going to have, but I know I wouldn't like locusts and honey. That was his diet. What a nasty diet. I don't like getting fingers all covered with stuff like that. Wow, locusts and honey. And he's coming with a purpose to make straight in the desert a highway for our God. When you go on over into the New Testament, you will find that John was faithful unto the obligation that he had right down to the last moment until his life was taken from him and his head was severed. Now why would that event transpire? It's being done to this very moment in time today. You would be surprised how many Christians in China, Iran, Lebanon, around this world, how many Christians are having their heads severed just like John did because of the stand that they have for the word of God. Do you know if how many got a Bible at home? About everybody? Anybody don't have one? I'll give you a used one if you really don't have one. But listen, folks, this book right here, it's hated. There's places they hate this book. They'll do all they can 
to get rid of it. But at the same time, there are places in this world that people will give their life for just one page of the Word of God. Just one simple page of the Word of God. So we see that today that we're living in perilous times. These perilous times are going to intensify. Intensify. What does that mean? It's going to get worse. And worse and worse. Things are being prepared for the coming of all of this hostility that's before us. Oh, we've seen a little bit of it right here in our own country, haven't we? Wasn't more than just six weeks ago, I think. A lot of it took place up in Washington, our own capital, our own. So we're seeing that this is going to be intensified it's going to continue to get worse and worse. But think of the obligation, the job, the responsibility that John had himself. How many of you would like to have been like Esther who went to the king of a nation? Go in there with a message. Here's the message that you might go into with some individual. If you could even get into a foreign country and to walk up to a foreign Islamic king with the message that Jesus saves and he died for you. That's basically what Esther had to do, isn't it? Unannounced. In before the king. Unannounced. That took some nerve. That's where fear might come in too, right? Fear. As I stand there. Well, another portion of scripture that I could use to you today concerning will you be my escort. Is my sheep hear my voice? And I know them. I want you to know that's talking about Jesus. That's Jesus talking right there. My sheep hear my voice. Who's the sheep? You, my friends. We're the sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. I'm glad he knows me. I'm glad he knows you. Because my name's in my book of life. How about yours? Amen? Amen? And I give unto them eternal life. So I can leave here anytime today and say, I'm going to heaven in the near future. I don't know when. But I'm going to go to heaven because Jesus died for me. He shed his blood for me. I've confessed my sins. I have called upon him. Therefore, he had promised that he would give me eternal life. Wow. In hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the foundation of this world. Wow. God before he created this earth, had a plan. A plan. You're part of that plan, my friends. You have a job to do. Your job is found in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 and 19. You are to go into all the world and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as we go into the world and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, we're to teach them also and to comfort them. Go back to chapter 40 and verse number 1 and 2 of the book of Isaiah. Here the word of God says, Comfort ye, comfort my people, saith your God. Now what does that mean, comfort you? What did I say? was taking place prior to chapter 41. God is speaking of his people as they came out of bondage. And as they came out of bondage, what did they do? They complained, and they complained, and they complained. They did that which was just not right. 
God, we'd have been better off we'd still been back there doing what? Working as a slave. Raising cucumbers. Things like that. For our diet. But, God says, I want you to be comf- bring comfort to my people. Speak comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received the Lord's hand double for her sins. Did she get away with that? No. As far as all those million of people that left Egypt, How many of them entered into the promised land? Two. Two two people. Two's all. Joshua and Caleb. What did they show? I'm sure that when they went in to that land and they saw these vast giants of the land at the time, goodness, They had enough nerve to say, hey, don't worry about it. God's on our side. We'll take care of it. We can take the promised land. But the majority said, no, we can't. We're like ants unto them. No hope for us. But then he says in verse 28 of uh, John chapter 10, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man, any man, any man pluck them out of my hand. No one, no one, absolutely no one. I'm going to heaven. I thought that was a good amen thought thought right there, but... (laughs) Bring in the smelling sauce and wake everybody up. (laughs) Ah, my goodness. And then in Exodus chapter 3, verse 12, it says, and he said, certainly, I will be with thee. I will be with thee. Who was it? Emily wouldn't be baptized because she was afraid that I'd drop her down and not pick her up. And she would drown right there in that water. But the Lord says, Certainly I will be with thee that I have sent thee when thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt. Ye shall serve God. And so I want to jump on over. My time's getting away. I I mean, I've got 100 pages here. (laughs) And we're going to cover 99 of them, okay? And so we turn to Isaiah chapter 40. And verses 1 and 2 where I've been at for a few moments. And as we turn there, we're going to find that the the prophet speaks tenderly to bring comfort unto the heart of his people. Hey, folks, listen. How many of you, the day you got saved, remember the joy that came? And the comfort that was there knowing now that, hey, heaven is my home. And when that took place, as did with the children of Israel when they left Egypt, the forced labor that was upon them was completed, and now they're on their way. Listen, folks, we today, now that we have been taken out from under really the power of the devil... Now we have Jesus giving us joy and peace in our heart. We now have that comfort there. And the guilt of the sin that was in our life has been put under the blood of Jesus Christ. And we know that the scripture says we can be saved by doing such. Do you know it's not God's will that any should perish today? Not any. Don't believe that comic book religion that's out there today that says, listen, not everybody's going to go to heaven. I don't care what Ed does, he's not going to make it. That's baloney. That's no good. That's straight from Satan, amen? 
My Bible says that all can come. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. Whosoever. Whosoever. We can't change that. There's been a lot of people that have changed things around. In fact, you will find that many verses have just been totally left out of God's word. And then we turn and we find and we see that these folks received ample punishment for what had transpired in their life. And only two were allowed to enter into the kingdom that God had promised them, a land of milk and honey. Wow. Think what heaven's going to be like. I know that the sign when you first enter into Colorado is deceiving unto you. Because all you see is sagebrush. But eventually you get to the mountains and where the beauty of God is. But heaven is going to be far greater than that. God still keeps his promises, folks. Remember, Genesis chapter 12. God says, I will what? Punish those that punish you, and I will bless them that bless you. I don't know whether Jerry read this or not, but I gave it to him over the phone a while back. It says, history documents, the multitude of miracles, a display of God's promises, and God's providence that fit together with divine accuracy reestablishes the Jewish nation in their original homeland. They are in their homeland today, right? They're having to fight to keep it. But notice what happened. God says, I'll bless them. I'll bless you. For those who argue that the Jews occupy lands rightfully owned to another people, author Gary Fraser notes, you cannot find the ancient neighbors of the Jews anywhere. Now remember, it says the ancient, the ancient. Now catch these next three thoughts, they're so good. Have you ever met a Moabite? No hand. I've never met a Moabite. Do you know any Hittites? Are there any tours that visits the Ammonites today? Can you find a postal code of a single Edomite? No, because these ancient people were dispersed from history and from the face of the earth, and yet the Jews, just as God had promised, return to their land, and they are there today, and they will remain there until Jesus Christ comes again. It's their homeland. And God does not lie. And God cannot lie. There's a song that I wanted to have played today, but I don't, don't know how to get all this stuff on screen and around. But how many of you ever heard of the song, It's Shouting Time in Heaven? It's Shouting Time in Heaven. Now then, I've heard a lot of groups sing it. But nobody sings it like the hoppers. The shouting time in heaven. It says unto you and to me, today we can have victory. I can have victory today in Jesus Christ. I don't have to go around with my head down to the ground. I can walk around as a proud individual. But we got to be careful because pride cometh before a fall, right? We understand that. But I can walk around as a proud individual in the simple fact that Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my Savior. I hope he's the Savior of everybody here. And so, don't be afraid to shout amen once in a while about it. Amen? And so, we see that we can have the promise of victory in Jesus. Anybody ever sing that song? Raise your hand. Yeah. Well, think of this. I don't know whether I said it a while ago or not, but we go back. We'll never walk alone. And they sing that song at these soccer games. Can you imagine? Imagine this. 40,000 people at one 
football game at halftime singing, You'll Never Walk Alone Again. Wow! That is spine tingling to even think about it. That should bring goosebumps up and down your back today when you think of that, that plus victory in Jesus. And when we all get to heaven, folks, I can't explain heaven to you. I can't really tell you what it's going to be like. It's beyond our imagination today to know the beauty of what heaven's going to be like. And so when that roll is called up yonder one of these days, I'm going to go. And Jerry and I have an argument about that. He says, well, he told a Jew one day, I'll just grab your hold of your heel as I go by and say, I told you so. <laughs> but listen, folks, I don't care who wins the race, him or I. It's going to be a pleasant time in the kingdom of heaven. Amen? Amen? All right, and then, you see, we will stand there face to face with our Savior. I will arise and go to heaven. I will embrace, he will embrace me in his arms in the arms of Christ my Savior, oh, there are then 10,000 charms. Oh, folks, listen, heaven's going to be a place of joy. Heaven's going to be a place of music. Can you imagine a choir of angels that is unnumbered singing victory in Jesus to you? When the roll is called up yonder, I'm saved by the blood of Jesus Christ today. Are you saved? There's power in the blood today. And we will sing those songs and we'll go on and there will be a shouting time in heaven when a sinner once lost is found. Listen, today, right now it could be. I believe the angels are getting tuned up right now because it's close to 12 o'clock. In fact, it's after 12 o'clock. Oh, pardon me. But the angels are beginning to rejoice in heaven. Why? Because one lost soul got saved. Somewhere in this land today, within the last two hours, someone's got saved. I am confident of that. I believe someone has turned to Christ. I believe that. How about you? How about you today? Do you know Jesus? Or are you like, as recorded in the word of God of a young boy who's called the prodigal, who's walking afar off, afar off. But the tabloid of the story is this, waiting at the end of the long, long road. There is a father waiting for that son to come home. It's the same way today. You're here today. You've never called on Jesus. He wants you to call on him today. Amen? Amen. We want you to rise up right now and examine yourself and to say, am I a Christian? Am I truly saved today? Or oh, would you stand with me at this time? We're going to give you an invitation. An invitation for you to come and to trust Jesus as your personal Savior. That's the greatest gift I could give you. Brother, what number? Page number 300. Okay.